Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar on key data for farmers. The webinar is facilitated by GIFAR, the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation, and is co-convened with the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Initiative, GODEN, and the Technical Center for Agricultural and Rural Cooperation, CTA. Uh, the webinar is part of a series, uh, and the whole series is a follow-up on a four-day course that we had in Centurion in South Africa in, in November last year. And in the, during the, the course, we discussed different aspects of farmers' access to data. And we wanted to capture what was said during uh, the course and uh, repurpose it in a series of webinars for everybody to access it. And this is the second webinar in the series. The presenter of this second webinar is Stefan Kaliesubula. Stefan is a computer engineer and an agripreneur, as he defines himself with this nice new word, an agripreneur from Makerere University in Uganda. He is a graduate researcher at the iLab at Mac project of Makerere University. Uh, his key technological interests are data science, robotics, Internet of Things, AI, and design. And as he says, his focus is on unlocking the potential of key data to allow growers make informed decisions. So, Stefan, I'll give the floor to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for that brief introduction. I'm called Stefan. That is super from Uganda. And I'm a good and champion at the same time, a data scientist. Key focus is unlocking the potential of key data for farmers. And uh, I welcome you to the second episode of uh, the Key Data for Farmers webinar, following up the farmers' access to data symposium in the workshop that we had in South Africa last year. And uh, what we are going to discuss today is uh, why do we need data and what is its importance. We are going to look at the difference between data, information, and knowledge, as well as the guiding principles for any data user that is the knowledge pyramid and the fair facets. We are going to look at the data streams, flows, and the key data involved. Uh, we have an example that we, we shall look at, and that is corn or what we call maize. We shall try to see how it moves through the food value chain, and we shall be able to identify the data it requires if one is to do corn growing or maize growing. We shall also look at uh, briefly on the livestock keepers, the data they need. And uh, the other thing we shall look at the file types for data and information, as well as the available data and information sources. Then the second last will be the role of e-solutions in data driven agriculture. And that is specifically, we shall look at a very interesting tool that we used in Centurion, and that is the crop planner tool. Lastly, we shall look at the data related questions that we all have to take into consideration. First and foremost, what is the essence of data to farmers? The data concept has been around for some good years, but uh, in today's world, it is possible to forecast the future much better than ever or to answer seemingly complicated questions much more quickly based on data. To be successful, a farmer must grow as much per acre as it can, reduce the risk of crop failure, minimize operating costs, sell crops for the highest price possible. This requires, among other things, effectively managing input resources like fertilizers, water, seed quality, and minimizing the impact of unpredictable variables like weather and pests. However, achieving that objective is not far from easy. Conventional methods like physical crop inspection are time consuming and can be inaccurate. While fixed and tractor mounted sensors alone can't, can't provide a real-time picture of what's happening in the field, farmers face further challenges in translating this data into operational insights that can help them understand which actions to take, where, and when. This is where the Agriculture 4.0 service comes in, or we can call it digital agriculture or precision agriculture. And basically, it's just generating the detailed insights into the operations and the environment of farmers in making data-based operational decisions to optimize yield and most 
revenue while minimizing expenses, uh, the chances of crop failure and also the environmental impact. When you look at this picture here, I don't know what these gentlemen are thinking about. Probably they have failed to meet the right customer or the potential buyer. So ideally, the interview in agriculture is meant to offer all these important objectives to any farmer or any service provider involved in the food chain. All that said, what do we need to say? Agriculture needs these answers to be, these questions to be answered. Ideally, farmers should start producing depending on the market demand, and this requires them to know how should I sow, plant, or harvest, or market? When should I sow, plant, or harvest? All oh, this is the data or the information that we need to have. What produce can I grow where? This can involve in probably exporting data from out, or it requires one to come and do a survey on their farms, on their soils to investigate all these properties, all these data they need to do appropriate farming. When we were in South Africa, uh, Nicolene was trying to put forward the difference between data, information, and knowledge. We all know that uh, data, information, and knowledge are closely related concepts, but each has its own role in relation to each other. Data becomes information suitable for making decisions once it has been analyzed in some fashion. Knowledge is derived from extensive amounts of experience dealing with information as a subject. When you look at data in its uh, score, it can be raw data. Raw data is unprocessed. It can be probably temperature or humidity levels. And when you give it to a farmer, ideally, it doesn't know what that means. It can be a vegetation raster image from the satellite. So when that is processed into information, it is categorized, it is contextualized in the form that one is able to identify what it means. And when the farmer has the know-how or the experience, now that is what we call the knowledge, it is to wisdom. So ideally, let's look at a very good example that Nicolin gave. This is a crop field boundary. It is a satellite image, but you cannot tell what it is. You cannot tell what do all these sectors mean. But when we apply the appropriate data modeling tools, we are able to know probably this is maize or this is cassava, you know, or, or maybe this is sugar cane. So this data is processed to this format. So ideally, when you look at this, it gives an insight for any decision maker. Probably this could be required by an investor who wants to invest in uh, uh, probably some region in a country, probably goes out and looks for this kind of data that is processed to this format and is able to know, oh, mm, like for example, in Western part of Uganda, probably maize is behaving or, male, or maize goes well in that part of the country. So having it in this form, it is really abstract for one to understand what it means. So now we are able to know the difference between data and knowledge. One of the guiding principles for key data we talked about, one is uh, the data knowledge pyramid. What is a data knowledge pyramid and how is it important? Any data scientist or any data user. A knowledge pyramid is just a set of linked steps by which data are processed into information, knowledge and finally to wisdom as used in decision making. The perspective postulates that data comprise a raw material that when combined with description and quality attributes leads to information. Information can be linked to other information sources and placed in causal chains to produce knowledge. Ultimately, knowledge serves as an input for decision based on wisdom which exists in the minds of the decision maker. And when you look at this, these are our data sources, probably satellites, or citizen observation, statistics, bioeconomic, or ministries, or agriculture, social media, sensors, probably. And this is a, it can be a moisture sensor or weather sensor, able to give you the amount of rainfall. It can be experimental data. So when we apply the appropriate data processing 
the, when we apply the appropriate data models, processing tools, we process this data into information. And with this, it can be shared using semantic webs or semantic technologies. And these really contribute to the open data or what we call data sharing. So right up here, this is where the decision makers lie. We have the researchers, the government, business, the farmers themselves, the NGOs, all those that are involved in making farm decisions. The second principle or the second key factor that we have to put in mind are the far facets. These principles have been around I think most of you are well conversant with them. But uh, all that said, we are looking at uh, the fair principles. How open is the data? Is that data really shared, open, or closed? When we come to accessibility, how easy is it for the farmers to access? And how is it is for the end data, or the person who does the data mining or data collection, how easy is it to access that data? So we are looking at interoperability and when we come to data interoperability we are looking at how various data sets can communicate with each other so this can happen at multiple levels it can be structural level we are looking at the data structures and the formats okay we can look at at the infrastructure level where multiple information systems are trying to exchange the data but this does not require the other received information systems to know uh, whether it's capable of interpreting the data. We look at reusability, how usable is the data? When you're speaking about crime and weather also, how usable is it? Are there permissions or are the users permitted to use or dis distribute? Okay, so this involves in data interoperability. So this is where we have issues of data rights and policies. So what rights do we have to have so that we can really use the data if we are available. The data streams. Uh, most of the times when we speak about data, when we speak to the farmers, when we are trying to investigate the challenges they're trying to face, they say we don't have information, we don't have data. But we need to understand there are various streams of data. We can have localized data. This localized data is like on-farm data. You have a farm, probably you have a chunk of land. You're able to make some soil samples and identify the soil structure, the soil properties. That is the data on your farm. You don't want to get it anywhere, okay? Probably you're doing maize growing and you keep on recording the cash flow. You're trying to record the pests and the weed size that you use. All this is the data that you really collect on the farm. So ideally, this is the data that the farmers are supposed to optimize and probably make sense out of it. Okay, it can be processed data. Okay, to information. It can be sensor data. Probably you have sensors installed on your farm and you're trying to get the soil properties. You're trying to monitor the crop yield. Okay, you're having irrigation schedules. All this is the data on your farm. Now. We have what we call imported data. This data is really bought by the users from out. It's not on the farm, but they have to get it from out. This is this can be, for example, a data. You cannot get market information or data on the farm, but you have to get it from out, probably from the media or from the televisions or from other various websites, or probably you're trying to use someone's API that gives you that market information. This is the data that you don't, you don't want to get on the farm, but you have to get it home out. However, it comes with the challenges. And one of the challenges is accessibility. How accessible is this data that you're trying to import from out? Availability, you're looking at usability. How usable is this data? Can you really try to connect it with probably various data sets that you've got? And it makes sense. Okay. And the other type is what we call exported data. Now, exported data is basically it, it, it can be taken up by an external entity, for example, the government or the ministry, or probably the bank. 
So for example, it can be an auditing firm, just come to your firm, just audited your firm, just uh, done all this computation, the costs, all those in card, okay, and probably take this data probably for their own purposes. So ideally, when we look at all these three data streams I've talked about, there are those data streams that are very important. For example, the localized data stream, this one is very important. Important is very important. When you look at auxiliary data, auxiliary data is really, it really has this impact on the farm. It can be done by, this data can be collected or done by the government agencies or research organizations, okay? It can be even generated using different methodologies or different methods, and probably they want to do some correlation Okay, this data can be probably auto-generated, sampled, okay? So that's why I'm saying that this data may not have that big impact on the farm. So this is a stream that uh, Ajit Maru, one of the key speaker, was trying to put forward to the participants. Let's look at the data flows and the information. This is an interesting uh, block diagram that Ajit Maru uh, put forth. Now, when you look at this flow diagram, okay, it runs from pre-planting up to consumption. If we're having a commodity, okay, it runs through all these stages up to consumption. So every stage, a commodity is subjected or a crop is subjected to a value, a value add, and that value add it comes with the appropriate data or information required. When look at the inputs, the seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, electricity, water management practices, machinery, labor, information management. Now, disease and pest is a negative input. We can have various negative inputs here, okay? So when we come to pre-planting, all this happens before one does the this information that is required, this data that is required at this stage. So when we cross to planting, this is where the information also comes in, whereby I may be recording probably the seeding date, okay, and the method of the seeding, the dimensions probably, the quality of the seeds, okay. So when it comes to cultivation, cultivation is also important. These are the practices that a farmer does on the farm, probably irrigation, fertilizers, okay, the practices like um, crop rotation, okay, mixed farming practices, okay. When it comes to harvesting, this is why we also put some focus, the appropriate data required in harvesting, for example, appropriate methods for harvesting, harvesting practices, okay, uh, the costs involved, okay. When it comes to storage, what are the best storage practices? What information do we have to give out to the farm? What knowledge, what data do we have to relate to the farmer? Ideally, we enrich the storage sector. For example, if I'm doing cassava growing and I need to store my cassava for a given period of time, what kind of data, what kind of information that the best storing practices I have here for before I'm going for it? When it comes to processing, what is the value add when it comes to processing? Apart from when you're done with the storage, probably you want to process the product or the yield that you've got to something else. Okay, all this is the information that the farmers need when it comes to wholesalers and retail marketing. Okay, you know, in a food value chain, we can be happy, we can be having wholesalers. Okay. whereby these wholesalers just look out for the farmers, they buy in bulk and they store. Okay. This can be retail marketing, okay, like supermarkets, then consumption where the customer is. Now, when you look at this entire food value chain, the outputs, we have the commodity. If we have the product, the water, energy, okay, and look at the energy, you're looking at there are certain crops whereby you can process its byproducts and get energy. And from the statistics, it shows that corn has a higher capacity for biogas. Okay, so imagine if you're doing corn to this point, okay, you process it prior to other products and you get these other byproducts, 
you convert it to biogas and you convert that biogas now to, to energy okay or to electricity okay and then you just wire up that energy back to probably to the sensors you have okay on your farm or to some irrigation systems so this is what we call sustainability it is a chain okay now when you look at transport transport is constant throughout okay when it comes to pre-planting you're going to have probably different uh, service providers like surveillance or soil expertise to test your soil to make some analysis on your soil okay all these are the costs involved when it comes to harvesting when it comes to storage the costs that are involved when it comes to processing consumption all those are the costs that are involved packaging it is constant throughout and is not by measure when it comes to packaging one will need to know okay if i have invested my i've got my yields how best can i package them how best can i plant them okay probably we're looking at uh, service providers for example the best and the weed side service providers how best can i package their weed sites how can they best package their fertilizers so that they reduce all the human health effects when we come to waste management or food waste, we need to monitor. We need to know the best practices to reduce the food waste. When we come to food security, this is where we put much of our focus. Because when you come to Uganda today, we we did some interviews some week back, and we were speaking about we were trying to interview some farmer who has he really gets interest because he has to spend all that time monitoring this stage cultivation up to harvesting up to storage okay and we look at the food storage mechanisms we have today when you visit most of the more from in sub-saharan africa they're still relying on the local methods okay whereby one builds a grocery probably on the farm and he gets the yields and stores them somewhere there okay and he's not sure how safe are they? How are they safe? So we need to know what are the best food safety or waste managing practices that we have to keep in mind. And the other factor that we really discussed is cash flow. Cash is constant. Everyone, a farm spends when it comes to pre-planting, planting, cultivation, harvesting, storage, all these stages, the farmer spends, but all this information, all this data, they don't really focus on it. So they need to know the best record management tools that they have to use. Now, we have looked at the data streams. We are going to identify what kind of data is available. When we come to on-farm data, what data is available? What data should the farmers really put focus on? And when you look at soil data, this data, probably I have a farm, this data is specific on my soil, it's specific on my land. When it comes to the soil texture, soil moisture, the arrangement of the particles, all this is the data. And when you look at the data that's picked from broad from my like one acre of land, it could be different from my neighbor. Okay? When it comes to soil acidity and alkalinity, this is specific to the soil. It is specific. Okay? And you know, pH really, really, it's important because it influences disease conditions and affects the availability of nutrients. And this is important for cassava growers. Okay? So when we look at uh, another when we look at another kind of data that is collected on the farm, okay, it, it is cash flow data. There are expenses, there are costs that the farm really have. And this is the data they have to really record often. And probably they can use this as a stepping stone probably to get loans from the banks. But when you ask them, they say, we don't have that. So when we look at the initial capital investments, the costs for input, the labor expenses, expenses on fertilizer, irrigation practices, when we come to the pesticides, the weed side costs, 
okay if i'm buying probably uh i'm trying i'm going to, if i'm buying probably best side control okay i have to record that what have i bought and how much have i bought it when it comes to the cost and sales for a unit i have to record that all this information all this data is collected on the farm now there yeah, we have other categories we have units per acre this data is collected on the farm the seeding data probably when did you start the seeding okay how did you do the seeding okay the data of the seeding and when did you do the harvesting the pestilence attacks what diseases for pestilence your farm and how did you overcome it all oh, this is the data or information that the farmer has to record the plant growth okay. you know most of the farmers today have uh, sensors installed in their gardens and one of them can be a hyper spectral camera probably it's a camera that you installed in your garden and it's trying to get for you 3d pictures to extract those images and you assess the stress levels of the crops this is the data collector on the farm. Customers and the suppliers, suppliers of farm inputs. Most of the time, these farmers, by they have uh, daily customers. They have these records, okay? Probably they have supermarkets they supply, and they have to keep this information. They have to keep track of this information. When it comes to the amount of vital nutrients, this is specific, okay? Because not all nutrients probably actually can solve soil, uh, soil problems. Some really opt for micro or macronutrients. The irrigation schedules. These schedules are set on the farm. Probably you have irrigation systems. Okay. The machine data. The machine data. We are looking at probably you have tractors. Okay. Tractors probably to do the harvesting. And these tractors probably they can show you how much they have collected. Okay. You have installed weather and soil sensors in your garden. You're trying to monitor the status of the soil, the moisture of the soil. Probably when you do uh, food processing, okay. You know, today when you visit most of the supermarkets, you do have packed foods, okay. And those foods do have the tags, okay. And if you come out today, okay, you're doing the processing of cassava, or you're doing uh, porridge, you know, you're, you're doing uh, the processing of cassava, and you pack it well and you put. A RFID tag or thing on it, okay, and you distribute it to supermarkets. You're here at home and you monitor how how many people have bought your cassava. Those are the RFID tags I'm talking about. Now let's look at the imported data. What data is really important? What data is really good outside the farm that is beneficial, that is important, that is helpful for one to make an informed decision. We can have the prices for farm outputs, okay? This can be regional, from regional markets or national markets. Like today in Uganda, we have very well performing market in Southern Sudan, whereby people who are doing maize growing, they do transport their units to Southern Sudan, okay? They need information concerning the, the units, okay? Confirming concerning the market prices set okay they need to know the market the price projections probably before i do uh probably cassava or i do news growing i need to know the projection in 10 years to come or few months to come that this is going to be the market demand or the prices are going to lower or the prices are going to increase when we come to another kind of data the tax ratings the license and the contracts in uganda today it's hard to operate an agricultural show or try you or you're trying to sell big potatoes when you, when you don't have a license okay all this information required by the farmers probably those who want to actually reach to the market reach to the point of processing the food and they want to sell it you have to be with a license potential customers okay the numeric in Uganda today uh, when you when we get the newspapers, the enumerary put some bits in the newspapers, probably they're calling for someone to supply, probably uh bushels, like bananas or like sweet potatoes. Okay, all this is the information that, that has to be received by the farmer. The prices from the trusted and genuine farm tools, 
okay because we know we have fake uh, farm input suppliers okay so we need to know who are those that are supplying genuine farm tools and what are prices okay and this information is required by this supplier as well because they need to know which farmers where are they what do they do so that they reach out to them and they sell their business ideas or they sell their farm tools to them when we come to the costs okay, for obtaining licenses the grants and loans from the banks all this information has to be got from out probably if i need to get a loan i have to know what does the bank want what are the securities that i have to present to the bank yes crop data crop data is important very very important in fact this is very important in the planning stage before you do any kind of growing or any kind of uh, planting okay you need to know you need to have this crop data you know different crops have different ph levels and moisture levels required different crops have different pests and weed control practices the nutrient values this is important before probably one does a certain kind of uh, uh, crop, he, he has to know what kind of nutrients probably that are in this crop. Okay? The weather reports and water management practices, the best fertilization methods, food processing practices, how can you reduce pollution, okay? the food waste control measures. Okay? All this information has to be got from outside, not on the farm exported data normally this data is taken up for aggregation probably by government agencies innovators or research organizations like local international organizations probably they're trying to do some research they come to your farm they collect some data they take it apart for further analysis all the government does is study just to find out how the farmers are doing the challenge are trying to face how much yields they have probably season after season all this data is exported now let's look at the example of maize it's true that 50 percent in sub-saharan africa rely on maize because it is a staple food uh, this is a variety it's called naru along is a variety for maize uh, now we are going to look at this kind of crop and we are going to sample it in the food value chain and we identify quickly which part requires more attention what information or data is required at every stage and the question that we are going to be asking also is what stage requires more data and information for one to do maize growing they have to go through the pre-planting stage they have to be with the crop data, the data that Dr. about. And this data includes probably nutrition data, okay, the best pests and weed site control measures, the intercropping methods, because you cannot grow maize, on, maize only, you can involve in different crops, but not all crops can be grown interchangeably or jointly. Okay. The rain forecasts. Okay. All this information is called probably from the cropping calendar. Irrigation schedules. If I'm on a farm, I have an acre of maize, probably I set irrigation schedules. All this data is collected. Price and demand market projections. I need to know what are the projections for maize. If I'm to do maize, and you know maize takes up around 115 days up to uh, maturity. So I need to know before I actually do maize, what will be the market or demand projections? The time to harvest and the possible yield. I need to have the planning tools probably to first visualize something before I do it. The access to credit. If I don't have credit, where can I get credit? Price forecast for farm inputs. The land selection, I need to select the land. And when you select the land, you have to do some analysis concerning soil. This data can be on a farm, probably you've done a soil sampling and you've identified 
or just always lacking and you have to look out for then when you have to add your soil beetle the available labor for, for for one to do the entire process of cropping the machines do i need the machines and the other stage is the planting because pre-planting basically it is with the planning stage before one does the planting so when you have identified the land the prior land you identify the farming identify the appropriate maize variety because not all varieties do perform well in the tropics okay? we're looking at the selection type how much are you going to put irrigation schedules okay because if you have probably irrigation systems installed on the entire land um, entire acre of maize you have to monitor all those irrigation schedules all this data is collected on the farm the soil characteristics you have to consistently monitor the properties of your soil because if your soil is behaving or is performing poorly don't expect to get good yields when looking at crop data when it comes to planting, still you have to use crop data because along the planting stage, there are best methods to do the crop. There are best methods to do the seeding. So all this information is formed in the data file. The cash flow. Cash flow is constant throughout. When it comes to cultivation, cultivation, this is why we experience most of the on-farm practices in the weeding. If I'm having a sensor installed in my garden, I need to monitor the plant growth, stress on the force of the crops, pests and the weed densities, the herbicides, the cash flow, the pest and disease control methods, the water management practices, the nature and the method of fertilization. When you look at this stage, this is a very complicated stage. In fact, last year, most of the sub Saharan countries first with uh, the army worms. Army worms attacked, attacked most of the maize uh, farms and in fact the majority had to lose out. So this is a very sensitive stage in the sense that one has to really pay much attention to identify the best practices, the best methods to monitor that maize before. Down here Waste management, food safety, and aquatic practices are important because we strictly start monitoring uh, our maize right away at the time we right away from the, state, the time we do the seeding up to the time of harvesting. So waste management practices have to come along. Okay, the food security measures have to come along. So when we come to harvesting and storage, what does maize require? Maize requires an optimum of 20 to 17 percent. This is harvesting. Before you do the harvesting, you need to, 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 to measure the levels. In, you need to know the grading. You need to grade your yields, okay? The amount of yields you've obtained, probably durable. Storage medium. How best can you store? How best can you protect? Those grains from pests, from rodents, okay, from birds, from worms. Okay, the drying strategy. The drying strategy. You know, maize requires 12 percent, 3.5 percent moisture content. With that, if you measure that, you're able to tell that, yeah, it is ready. When we come to marketing and packaging, this is the information required. The packaging and the branding practices. Okay, if have my maize. I need to know how best can I brand it, how best can I package it, get away here. What are the best markets? Which markets are say are having higher prices, higher demands, and along the way I incur transport costs. I need to identify what are the best routes. If I do have regional markets and international markets, I need to identify what are the best markets? Which markets are having best prices? Identify the wholesalers and retailers. So when it comes to food processing, I may not be wanting to stop here. I may be wanting to process further to probably 
maize meal or porridge or bread pro or maize pests or beer. Then you need to know what are the best practices for adding value to processed maize. Okay, the costs and the availability of the milling machines. Can I do this locally? Can I process this locally at my home? What do I need to do this? Okay. The packaging and branding practices. These are very important because maize is very sensitive to moisture. If you package it badly, if you package it badly, without following the right protocols, it's just going to mess up with you. Okay, the prices and demand. So with all this, put into consideration, we need to put in mind the waste management practices. Okay, how best can we reduce the food waste? Briefly, let me also speak about livestock, livestock data. Um, most of the farmers today in sub-Saharan Africa are doing what you call small, small farming practices in livestock. However, the information required by the growers, it also cuts across uh, to the livestock keepers. The market information is still the same. When we come to the farm management, uh, the data that it requires, the data it requires, the drug spraying methods. If I'm doing poultry, I do poultry keeping, but this is all what I need. The pest and disease control methods, probably for cattle, pest methods, the infrastructure, the ventilation, how we, how we set up uh, a building for poultry, okay? feed formulas. You know, feed formulas for poultry keep changing depending on the growth. And to feeds, you know that uh, in, in Uganda today, uh, the population is competing with the poultry industry for soya beans and silver fish. So what are the best alternative feeds for livestock? The climate and weather conditions is important. Harvesting and storage practice are important. The breeding performance, environmental information is important. Okay. And you know, number one contributor for greenhouse gas emissions is cattle. So we need to know what are the best practices to overcome this. Okay. The tracing, okay. Security, we need to know how best can we track our livestock, okay? Because theft is common everywhere, okay? Other best methods, can we have chips probably installed on every cut on the train to monitor forever it goes? The train to monitor the feed intake, the chewing activity for cattle, or the temperature, the ruminant pH. All this is the data required. It can be collected on the farm. It can be data exported from out or imported from out. So other can be added value, transport costs, the breeding methods and species, best practice for processing byproducts probably into biogas. All this is important. Now, let's look at uh, the five types for data information you know uh, most of the time farmers don't really work with data farmers rarely do with the data directly so their challenges are usually more with the information services and decision making tools that way the data is solved now we have various file types okay these file types uh, are more like um, used by any data source probably to put in the data or triple the data. And the most common is the comma separated variable. This is a common file type. It behaves more like Excel. Okay? And uh, when we look out for the file that databases, most of the files are under CSV format, the JSON. Okay, this is normally used by the app developers. Probably you're trying to develop the API that is going to be sent market information to uh, probably on the media, on the television, on people's smartphones, or probably a company needs certain data set or certain information or data concerning probably climate. So you sit down and develop a JSON script and you just send a JSON file and when it accesses it, 
is able to see that information. So it can mean extensible markup language, okay? Uh, this is a bit complicated, as if no one, farmers cannot really work with, with this. Uh, RRDF, the resource description framework, I haven't really worked with these two, but I've worked with these three. They're really good, especially when it comes to API deformment, like change or CSV file. The data sources available. You know the various sources we have today, but what we keep on asking ourselves is uh, how accurate and how sensitive and how helpful is that data? What I've been able to identify today, uh, when we look out for file stat, file database, okay, it has various data sets concerning production for crops and livestock, trade matrix indices, the food balance, food security price, prices, price indexes for, for fertilizers. One that I've been able to identify and has been really helpful is Infonet Biodivision. It's very, very good. It has the information in a contextualized format. Okay, it has crop data. The, the, if you want to do maize, just look out for this website. You're going to find the crop data it requires. Okay, you're going to find out various crops with various crop data. Okay, you're going to find foods uh, data, medicinal plants, vegetables. Okay, you're going to look at the geographical distribution in Africa. Okay, you're going to find out uh, information concerning pests, information concerning diseases, information concerning weeds, information concerning uh, the, the best practices for controlling weeds, weeds. Okay, even if you check out for human, okay, you're going to find out the healthy foods, the nutrition related diseases, the animals, you're going to find out more on this. It's really up to date. They really update it and it's really helpful. And we have really used it in most of the applications that uh, I'll demonstrate uh, in my second webinar. Uh, the other is the World Bank. You can look out for this as well. And try to see what you can extract from the population statistics, the commodity prices, the fowl. This is important for fish farmers. Okay, the water resources, you're trying to find out the dams, water rated institutions, okay, uh, the weather concerning whether the geomaps, you're able to find out all this from the file, the database for aqua. So you can think, I believe you've seen more data sources, but these are the few I've worked with. Uh, when you look at the challenges concerning data, data in its context, ideally, farmers really work, out, work with data. So they really don't find challenges because they really find challenges with the service providers. The providers and the handlers of data driven services tend to face most of the issues with the data itself. This is true, especially for imported data and the probably on farm data when it comes to data reporting and storage. So these are the common challenges of our ability. ability the relevance and the usefulness of the data, the data ownership, because most of the people will really fear to release their data because probably it, it contains personally identifiable information. Okay, so the timeliness, the trustworthiness of the data, how how is one able to use various data sets together? Can various data sets communicate to each other if one is to use them? So these are some of the challenges that the culture 4.0 Operation Agriculture is going to address. And the opportunities we have today are the smartphones. How best can we use the smartphones to really relay this information, to use the smartphones as the data reporting tools, the smart Internet of Things sensors? Can we have sensors that can collect data on climate, Soil moisture, fertility, the root and shoot growth, okay, the stress levels of the crops. 
if uh, this was a, a very good example that Moses Bodeke from Asterica is trying to share. It's trying to give the soil properties. Lights green means lights red means lights blue. It shows you, it tells you something is going wrong, or you have to make some decision somewhere, or probably you have to do the whole irrigation, you have to turn some irrigation systems. So all these functionalities, all these functionalities of the smart IoT install sensors, farmers really find it hard to do this physically to really investigate what's the behavior of the crops. So we do have the farm management information systems. Okay, the decision support systems, we can have this developed for these farmers. The GIS systems, probably the ministry, this will be important, so that the ministry will turn the world for its economy. The ICT enabled learning environment, like chatbots. Okay, uh, chatbots are more like AI driven engines, okay, whereby you can communicate with the data set, you can ask, like, uh, uh, what is the price for maize probably in Kampala and it gives you that price so that's a chat but it's more like uh, an application but it's data driven specific to Q&A so we have the e-wallets the modeling solutions we can think of the modeling solutions the drone technology today but the question is how many farmers how many smaller farmers can really access all these services when it comes to drones how many smaller farmers can use drones probably to to, uh, to do real-time monitoring they're trying to get 3d pictures of the farms probably trying to do some future extractions from the leaves okay you're going to find out that this can only be done by the small product farmer but probably if they join up in a group they can probably get the drone and you know group. now uh let's look at uh, the e-solutions we can have that we can use that we can develop to share all this information, all this key data required for farmers. At any stage, knowledge and information must be effectively, efficiently delivered to stakeholders in order to achieve that the ICT enabled services and tools may be employed appropriately to deliver quality information while reducing time and costs. When you look at this pie chart, uh, this is the report from uh, the agriculture sector from eTransform. When you look at this calendar, this pie chart, it really shows you the decisions that one has to make in the cropping cycle. When it comes to pre cultivation, okay, one has to know the crop selection criteria and the decisions they have to make are based on the information systems, probably the information. On here, probably there's an ICT enabled learning platform where they can get information, or there's a modeling solution that they have to base on to make that decision. The land selection, it takes up decision one and two, okay. The learning practices, the information systems, okay. When it comes to calendar definition, okay, this is dependent on the climate and the weather patterns, the decisions they have to make. Okay. so one may need to have an information system that gives that information or an ICT enabled learning platform okay access to credit one two three four five ICT enabled learning solutions when it comes to crop management practices what solutions what data driven solutions can we have okay we can have land preparation and sowing practices okay and the decisions they have to make is based on the information uh, available here, the information available in the ICT enabled learning platforms. Okay, when we come to water management and fertilization, the solutions that we can have, one and four, sensory and proximity. Can we have all these developed for these farmers? The pest management practices, one and four. Okay, information systems, including decision supporting systems, basic information supporting systems. So 
we can have an information supporting system that gives all this information concerning pests management. Okay, when it comes to post harvest, okay, post harvest runs from marketing up to food processing. All these are the solutions that we can have when it comes to marketing, okay, six and five. We need to have ICT enabled networking solutions, okay, the online commerce, commerce tools whereby one logs into the website and finds out the information they need to know about the performing, the highly performing markets, okay. When it comes to packaging, okay, they need to know. Uh, packaging comes with uh, the best practices for branding, okay. If you're packaging something, don't all uh, units are packaged in the same way. Different units are packaged in different. So these solutions may be specific at one level or on multiple levels, but all integrated or interconnecting uh, towards contributing to the common benefit. Or, so um, let's look at uh, a very important uh, tool that we used. Uh, this tool was provided by Dan, and uh, it's a crop planner. It's one of the data-driven solutions. It helps you to make projections of the yields of the revenue based on given factors. Okay, so sorry, when we click on it, okay, so this is. Uh, Crop planner tool. Okay, it uh, Stefan, helps you. I okay. I think what you shared is only the presentation. So now that you are using another uh, application, it's not showing. Okay, now we see the presentation. Maybe we have to share the screen again with the other application that you were using. Or oh, maybe I'll share that at the end. Okay. Uh, because we couldn't so, see um, what, what you were doing. We, we couldn't see the screen. Okay, fine. I'll show that tool. I'll cheer it and what the data it requires. So what you can look out for ideally, you can look out for a crop calendar. That is crop calendar designed by file on this link. You can go and look out for it and try to check on the available cropping calendars. Okay, you can, when you go to this uh, link, you select a crop country, then it shows you the best uh, seasons for seeding, the best seasons for harvesting, the best uh, practices for yielding, all this can be found. Now, you need to think about this, the data related questions. These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. Anyone who accesses, anyone who uses the data, when it comes to data discovery, what do I need to know? Am I able to access the data? Am I permitted? Is this data shared or open? Do I understand really what this data is? What questions can this data answer if you're processing the data to information? Does it really answer a few questions? Okay. Is this data set really up to date? Is it consistent? Are there are no errors in this data, and how can you identify that there are no errors? And how much effort do you require to make this data usable? Okay. And what support do you need? What resources do you need so that you really make sense out of this data? When we come to the reusers, the people who probably look out for the data sets and import them for use, okay, technically, the question that we have to ask that the question that we have to put into consideration one is is the data available in a form of appropriate content okay that data probably can be relayed in the csp file or json file and if you're doing a json file and you're trying to access someone's api that relays probably market information how is reliable is it is that a well structured format is that data structured in a format that is readable or uh, you can use it to extract features out of it? Okay. When it comes to social issues, are there 
existing communities of users of the data? Who really needs the data? Who really needs the information? Okay, is this data officially supported like for market? Uganda today, the government really supports market information in terms of developing these solutions. It really looks forward to putting this information even in, in the newspapers, on television. Now it's upon data service providers to look out for this data. Okay. Now, when we come to provenance, provenance ideally, you're looking at the, the existence, who owns the data, okay. what rights are attached to that data. Do I have to really sign probably something before I access the data? And does anyone else really need the data to probably compare it? Okay, is the data sets really clear? Are the data sets really clear? So these are some of the questions that we have to really put in mind before really we give this information to the farmers. Because ideally, uh, sometimes we may end up misleading the farmers because of the information and data we're trying to give them. So all these questions, when you put them together, it really gives you a clear cutting direction to take. To take. So, lastly, what do we need to do to make sure that the culture 4.0 digital agriculture happens? These are the, some of the suggestions that the participants try to put forward. And the first is uh, we need to optimize and make sense out of on farm data. Realize that on farm data is very important, but what a farmer is lacking. What is the challenge is that facing is uh, probably don't have the appropriate data reporting tools. They do the best practices for it, for recording this data on the farm on a daily basis. Okay, so we need to work with the farmers to understand their challenges because not every solution is important. So we need to work with the farmers to identify where are they making mistakes. What part of the food value chain requires more attention? What part requires more data or information? So we need to help farmers to learn frequently. Uh, we also need to advise farmers to stop working in isolation. This was pointed about pointed out by Nick from Nigeria, it's a cassava grower. She said that most of the farmers today in sub-Saharan Africa they work in isolation. You don't really know what the neighbor is doing, but you find out that the neighbor probably has more information than you. If you work together, you're able to learn. And uh, we also have to develop data-driven mobile applications. Now it's supposed to be specific. Not all applications are useful. Okay. And uh, what Nick, Nick was a, a very good participant. She said that we should stop calling farmers smallholder farmers. We should call them agripreneurs. Agri-entrepreneurs, I will always look forward to see how they can turn farming into business. But when you keep calling them small, they will be small forever. They will never think that farming can really be a business. And lastly, nutrition data is missing. Okay? And uh, the reason why it's missing probably they are not accessible data sets. Okay? And uh, actually, if we look for the statistics for nutritional diseases in Africa, find that most of the uh, poorly performing countries are from Southern Africa. So if we have this nutrition data, probably it can help the farmers to grow well, probably to focus on certain crops that are very nutritious for people. Yes, lastly, thank you for the attention. And uh, what we have, what is coming uh, next is uh, there is an webinar for Dan there. It's on um, crossing the Donga. If you want to cross the Donga, if you want to see the future of farming, please don't miss this webinar. Very, very good, very, very important. And I also provide a pre recorded webinar on uh, mobile applications by various service providers. We shall deeply look into them and how it is for a I think that's the end. Thank you very much, Stefan.
That was yes. really informative. Thanks a lot. Uh, we already have a few questions for you. So I'm, I'm sorry that we are over one hour now. I hope people can stay to listen to your answers to these questions from the participants. Okay, we have a question from ECO. Uh, ECO says that it seems that this approach, like collecting very, very detailed data and perhaps use it, is more appropriate for large-scale companies or large-scale farms. How can you ensure that smallholder farmers can benefit, <clears throat> considering limitations in literacy, access, skills, etc.? Okay. Uh, that is a very interesting question. In fact, when you look at uh, some of the recommendations that uh, the participants gave uh, concerning smallholder farms, and uh, one one key thing that we we know down to was if we help these farmers to form groups. Okay, because ideally when you look at the practices for collecting this data, they're not really expensive, they're not really all that cumbersome, but when they are in the group, probably they can help, they can empower each other, they can probably share tools, the data collection tools to really collect for the collect this information required. Because I did when you look at the various data streams, I looked uh, I really explained more on the on farm data, the data that these farmers collect on a daily basis. So that's what we should start with. And when you look at the practices that these smaller farmers really use, actually they don't really mind if you find a small order farmer trying to do cassava on a small scale probably for the market and you ask him okay what information do you need you tell you i need market information i need uh, geographical information but this information is not important to him but what we can do is really focus on on the on farm data the farm the data that they collect consistent on the farm how can we optimize it and this can be through empowerment, forming organizations, okay, forming trainings, involving them in multiple sessions concerning innovations, trying to work with them. Okay, so the more we work with these small order farmers, the more we shall identify the challenges that face them. And the and the more we shall look forward to develop solutions to help them. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, we have another question. Uh, I hope this uh, question was answered. Eko, I hope you're happy with the answer. Otherwise, you can add another question or a consideration in the chat. Uh, Jeffrey has another question. He's asking, what tools or applications are used to extract knowledge from data? Hey, that is a very interesting question. Yeah. What tools do we have or we normally use to extract information from data, isn't it? Now, that question is a bit technical in the sense that most of the time the data science or people who do the data visualization really use the data modeling tools, okay? For example, when we look at climate, okay, we have the hydrological models that we do use to develop uh, the right model, the climate patterns. Okay, and those tools ideally they cannot be used by the farmers to do that. But now, when you look at other categories of data, for example, uh, the yields probably they collect on that farm. Okay, you're trying to tally that I've got like 100 sacks, 100 kilograms, you keep on reporting that. Now, uh, this is rather uh, we have the data driven solutions application, like uh, the one I wanted to show you the crop planning tool, okay? Probably when you have the data that you've been collecting, you try to tally it, to save it somewhere, and you can probably use it for other practices, probably for the next year to make projections, to try to see how you performed, what costs that you incurred, how much you spent, how many customers do you have, what are the best or the good customers you have, which customer really ordered for more, more of your yields, you see that. So it really depends on what data you're really working with. If it is uh, market information, all what you need is the smartphone and an application probably, because when we look at market information, it's really processed to an understandable format, but we look at climate and weather, it's really abstract, okay? When you say it's uh, 70 degrees centigrade, the farmer is not going to understand that. So now it's upon me who is offering a service to them 
to really put now these values to the sense. In other words, I need to know if I'm the farmer and I'm getting 70 degrees centigrade on my farm, that does not make sense to me. So all what makes sense to me is to you to tell me that, you know what, it's more likely to rain in the next month, depending on the values that we have been getting. So it depends on what data you're really, really working with. Thanks again, Stefan. We, we, we now have a lot of questions, actually. I hope you still have some time. There is a question from Patricia. Uh, she says, I wonder why there is no consideration to gender across the board. Uh, the way we access, use, and analyze data is contextualized by gender, and I haven't seen any consideration throughout the presentation. How do you consider data use management by gender? A gender analysis of data use and management might be helpful and important. What do you think, Stefan? Uh, gender, you know, gender issues are really, really complicated. But the truth of the matter is, in Uganda today, I'll give you a very good example. The farmers that we really work with, uh, now we, we have a category of farmers who are dealing in poultry, and there are these other ones who are dealing in uh, cassava, and maize growing and pineapple. So all what we really look out for is that if these people can really work in a group, then gender issues cannot be seen anywhere. You get the point. So if you have uh, people from different cultures, people from different uh, regions, people from different regions of life, coming together to work together, probably to deliver a product on the market, okay? And within themselves, uh, you may find that they could be one with the best or with a good idea on data storage, okay? Probably one has an application, okay? Probably to record the data, okay? And the issues concerning gender in data collection, when you come to Uganda, there are very many, very many ladies, or I'll call them, uh, women who are doing well in farming. And a good example is uh, the live example we had in the uh, interior. Uh, we had most of the participants who are very active, especially there were women. And uh, she was a cassava grower, but she tells you she works with community leaders, she works with innovators, she works with the researchers together. And they, if they all work together, because you may find that if she's doing a cassava and she doesn't know the best practice for data storage or data management, and here is working with the data inno uh, innovator or an app developer, definitely this app developer will be able to understand the challenges she's facing and she will be delivering a solution specific or tailored to her, uh, her needs. So that's how probably we can uh, the gender issues over. But Thanks, Stefan. I don't know if Varelia wants to add something on that, but... No, I was wondering, I, I agree with your answer. Um, I, I, I guess the, the use that normally we do uh, of uh, gender analysis of data is mostly with socioeconomic statistics and, you know, population data and also um, how many women work in farms, etc. And this, I think this is done uh, in global statistics and country level statistics. Of course, in the kind, in the type of data that you illustrated during the, the presentation, uh, this is more difficult to do because in some cases it's completely gender neutral. And in other cases, uh, since most of this is farm data, I don't think this is recorded, but it's an important point I think to, to take. For each type of data, one can think of what kind of gender uh, analysis can, can be done. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or maybe she was trying to, to say that, uh, you know, on the farm, there is this data that is collected on the farm probably by third parties probably that come in, comes on your farm, collects that, uh, what your sex, what's your age, what's your family, that is private data, and probably you can ask to design, to, to have a consent. You can ask to, to write uh, a consent form or to sign on a consent form that giving you my data on the form, but please, you shouldn't disclose my private, my, pri my data concerning privacy, like my information concerning age, years, that. Or maybe that's what she was trying to say. But most of the times when we do collect this data, we really 
have to explain to the data providers why we are looking for this data and specifically what data are we looking for because if I do get okay in certain coordinate uh, certain region around a hundred ladies involved in uh, this kind of farming okay that is not going to much help me to solve that solution so ideally all what that said is that that's why the data rights now come in probably one has to have that concept even when my data I need to know the privacy how how protected is my data even my data but I need to know why I'm checking it yeah I agree uh, another question from Sergio. He's asking, uh, okay, his question is a little bit related to Eco's question. He says, are there experiences where someone has influenced government policies in order to facilitate data access to smallholder farmers? Yes, there are there. Policies have been designed by the government ministries. And in Uganda today, uh, for real, I think I discussed this with you last time that yes. they released the data privacy bill, the data, the data privacy bill, and uh, basically it's supposed to to pave way for all those that are looking for the right information to make decisions. For example, uh, uh, in the Parliament of recent, they say that information concerning crime and weather is free of access. Just go to the right data source, the right data center, ask for the data, why are you using it, why are you taking it, and give them clear reasoning and you get the data. And today they have released API. So just log into, access the data you want, get a point. So policies can be designed concerning data access. However, this requires one to know what data do you want to access. Because that is that is attached to a policy. If you're looking for data, for example, uh, uh, you're trying to get data from another farmer, how he, how his farm performed last year, the amount of yields, that can be a bit specific. And if you're looking for it, I have to sit down and say, oh, wow, you're taking my data, but why? Or probably have to sign something somewhere. Okay, So it really depends on what data specific are you looking for. And that is going to come with the policies attached. I will ask you another question from Alexandre. Alexandre is saying, you wrote about sensors and devices, like drones and drone surveys, but this is just a means. But the key to have information is the algorithm of software that analyzes images taken to deliver information that enables such or such decision. So the key is to know what information and what algorithms you use, perhaps compared to the importance of data, I guess. Okay, yeah. I guess this, this is just an observation maybe yeah, you can just yeah, it's, comment it's on a, this. Yeah, it's, it's a comment, it's a comment. And uh, the, the, what I explained was the tools that we use in data collection. You get, and of course, when you look at the drones, if you get a drone on the flight, you get an aerial view of the farm, you get a picture and you use an algorithm to extract the features of that picture. So I was just trying to show the tools that we can use and probably some of the data processing tools that we can use that data into information, but it's a good comment. Yeah, I, I Jeffrey is also commenting uh, on Eco's question about smallholder farmers. Uh, also, this is just a comment. He says, I think there is a need to repackage this information into absorbable content for the smallholder farmers. And I, I guess you agree on that. Yeah, that is right. And one last question uh, from Maruf. Maruf is asking, soil data provided by FAO are gener generalized spatially. How useful are they to farmers? Well, that, that is a, an interesting question. In fact, not only FAO, but when you look out for most of the, the satellite images or when you look out for solid data sets that are global and you come back to the smallholder farmer and you try to assess the situations, the lives they go through. And if you get this solid data set, probably it's trying to show you that this part of the region has uh, uh, long soils. Okay, they are good for this, they are good for this. Okay, but when you bring this data to the smallholder farmer, it's going to be useless. 
Because ideally, when you're speaking about smallholder farmers, these are the people who own small chunks of land, two acres, three acres, and probably they could be producing for the market. All what you need to look out for is to assess the soil properties of the land. And probably when you look at the global soil data sets, probably this could be all the investors, okay? When I'm coming to Uganda, and I have probably a first look out at FAO and I get that uh, solid data set. I try to probably visualize it, convert it into information, and I get to see that a central part of Uganda uh, is suitable for maize. Now, that is helpful for me, the investor. And actually, when you look at the solid data sets, they're helpful for the ministries. Okay, of recent, I think I must have shared this. Most of the East African economies or countries here, yeah, they really don't know what soil data sets can do for them. Of recent, uh, they distributed some seeds to northern part of Uganda and it was really a hot. Okay? Do you imagine supplying soya beans to the country, the northern part of the region that has been experiencing a poor climate, you, you know, very hot, very dry. And what are the farmers going to do? They will just instead cook those things and have them. So idea if the government or the ministry that is planning for its economies, if it has these soil data sets, and if these data sets are processed into information, you're able to tell, okay, if Northern Uganda has this kind of vegetation cover, it has this kind of soil type, it has this kind of uh, soil uh, depth probably, it is suitable for this. This is what we can provide for them. This is the best crop that, are, that can be grown in this region. So it's two way. It depends on who needs it and how useful is the data. Thanks a lot, Stefan, also for this answer. Um, I think now we can close the webinar. It actually lasted much longer than we foresaw. It's almost one hour and a half. Thank you so much, Stefan, for your time. And thank you, everybody, for participating and for all the questions. Aurelia. Yes, tell me. Oh, I didn't show them the crop planner tool. Maybe you can share the link in the chat yeah. window so that people yes, can download it. To... But it's not free. Remember, it was given us by Dan. It's one dollar. You can just get it and try to see what it can do. Okay, so you, you can share the link uh, yeah, in the chat window. In the meantime, thank you, everybody. Uh, I put the link to the web page where you can find always updated information on this series of webinars. So the, the links to the recordings will be there. The links for the registration to the upcoming webinars will be there. Thank you very much again. Goodbye.